And I want to say thank you for all of your prayers and thank you for all of your giving towards phase two. Uh, we're rolling along. They have uh, they put the crane in place. They have put all the steel. The steel is all arrived. It's on trailers. It's uh, all numbered. And beginning tomorrow, they're going to start lifting columns and cross beams into place. Uh, the building was shaking at the end of the week because they were preparing the side of this building to uh, connect the structure of the new building. And so we were kind of shaking, shaking in the office. Well, I don't know what they were doing, but it was shaking the whole place. Uh, but uh, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your giving. Uh, we have about 1.4 million left to come in on the Jump In Capital campaign. We do need all of that to come in in order to finish the new building. And if you can give something right now towards the pledge that you've made, it would be a great help. If you haven't made a pledge, uh, we're doing a, an effort called Jump In to raise the money for the new building. And if you want to jump in and you want to help with a gift right now, um, it would help us out a lot. Still haven't borrowed any money for the construction of Phase 2, and we praise the Lord for that. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm going to read one verse uh, in this chapter and then jump to, to chapter 13. Uh, look at verse 14, 2 Corinthians 12 uh, verse 14, Paul says, Now I'm ready to visit you for the third time. I will not be a burden to you because what I want is not your possessions but you. I'm not going to read the rest of chapter 12, we don't have time, but I'm going to be referring to the following verses. But jump to chapter 13 and verse 1. Paul says, this will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. And now I repeat it while I'm absent. On my return, I will not spare those who have sinned earlier or any others, since you're demanding proof that Christ is really speaking through me. He is not weak in dealing with you, but he is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak, but in him, by God's power, we're alive dealing with you. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you, unless, of course, you fail the test? And I trust you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong, not so that people will see that we have stood the test, but so that you will do what is right, even though we might have seemed to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We're glad, however, when we're weak, but you're strong, and our prayer is that you may be perfect. This is why I write these things while I'm absent, so that when I come, I will not have to be harsh in my use of authority, the authority the Lord gave me for building you up and not tearing you down. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Yes. Aim for perfection. Yes. Encourage one another. Yes. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All God's saints here send their greetings as well. May the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to just speak to us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people that you love so much. Thank you for your presence here. And thank you for your powerful word. Your word is truth. Father, I pray that we would just encounter you this morning through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you just say amen and amen with me. Beloved, I want to tell you this morning that Jesus is coming again. After Jesus was crucified and risen from the dead, for a period of about 40 years, he appeared to his disciples and he appeared to hundreds of others. He told his disciples, 40, what did, I say? what did I say? What did I say? 40 years? Oh, 40, yeah, 40 days, thank you. <laughs> the clocks have got me all messed up, all right? It's the, it's the blame on the clock. For a period of 40 days... Jesus appeared to the disciples and many others. And then he ascended to heaven before their eyes. They kept looking up until they couldn't see him anymore. And two angels appeared to the disciples and they said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into the sky? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come back in the same way 
that you have seen him go. Jesus is coming again. He's coming on an appointed day at an appointed hour that no one knows but the Father. Will it be in our lifetime? I've always believed so ever since I was a little boy. I remember as a kid in church hoping that I would get to go to college, hoping that I would be able to get married and enjoy adult life. Now my kids wonder the same things. Looking at the events of the last few years, it certainly appears like the world stage is being set for his return, but there are still many things that have to transpire. Uh, I tell my kids, listen, when they start rebuilding the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, take cover and start looking up. <laughs> Jesus is coming again in an entirely different disposition than he came the first time. During his earthly ministry, Paul says Jesus came in weakness. He came in the poverty of human existence. He came in humble submission to the Father's will. He came as God's suffering servant foretold by Isaiah. On the cross, Jesus laid down his life as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. But now he wears the victor's crown. And when Jesus comes again, he will come in power as the roaring lion of Judah. When he comes again, he will come with his reward in one hand for his faithful ones, and he will come in a sword with his other hand to judge the unfaithful. The question is, will you be ready for his coming? Jesus said, when I come again, will I find faith on the earth? When Jesus comes again, will he find you in faith? Will he find faith in you? For the last couple of months, we've been traveling together through 2 Corinthians. Paul wrote this letter to prepare his troubled church for his third and his final visit to them. For a number of years, things had gone from bad to worse in the Corinthian church, mostly because of some troublemakers who were trying to steal Paul's sheep. After a disastrous second visit, he wrote a severe letter that was carried to Corinth by Titus, and Paul received the better news that the Corinthians were mostly sorry. Now Paul is coming to them again, this time to administer the Lord's judgment to those who are still damaging the Lord's church. And so he writes 2 Corinthians to prepare them for his coming. I'm ready to visit you for the third time. I'm afraid that I won't find you as I want you to be. On my return, I will not spare those who have not repented. That's why I write these things while I'm absent, so that when I come, I won't have to be harsh in the authority the Lord has given me. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Don't you realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Paul was Jesus' unique representative. He was uniquely authorized to speak on Jesus' behalf. And Paul's admonition to the Corinthians here is really Jesus' admonition to us. When the Son of Man comes, Will he find faith? I'm coming again to you. Examine yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Is Christ Jesus in you? What Paul expects of the Corinthians when he comes again is also what Jesus expects of us when he comes again. How do we know if we're ready for his coming? How do we know if faith is in us, if we are in the faith? How do we know if Christ Jesus is in us? How many of you remember pop quizzes from school? You remember pop quizzes? Patty Yuva said to me this morning, I hate pop quizzes. Well, we're going to take a little pop quiz today. This is going to be an open Bible quiz. This is going to be an open heart quiz. This is going to be a self-graded quiz. That's entirely subjective. But in these closing words, Paul says, test yourself. Yes. As I look at his words in 2 Corinthians 12 and 13, I want to ask you seven different questions this morning that test whether or not you're ready for Jesus' coming. 
And I want you to answer each one of those questions in your heart with either a pass or a fail. There are no percentages. There's no scale of one to ten. Either your heart can answer pass or it must answer fail on each one. So you're ready for the pop quiz this morning? All right, pop quiz. Seven questions to test if you're ready for his coming. The first question is this. Do you sense God's presence with you? The first and the most important test is one that only you can determine for yourself. Is Jesus Christ living inside of you? Do you sense his presence with you? Do you have an inner assurance that you belong to him? I've shared this story many times. Most of you know it. I was eight years old on the night that I received Jesus alone in my bed. I had been to a spirit-filled church service for the first time in my life earlier that evening, and all I knew was that I wanted what I saw those people had. So I prayed a simple prayer. It wasn't theologically precise. It wasn't confessionally accurate, but it came straight from my heart. I simply said, Lord, I want everything that you have for me. Can't tell you that my bed shook. Can't tell you that a light shone or that I heard a voice from heaven, but I can tell you in that moment, the beautiful presence of God came to me and he has never left me since. Every moment of every day from that night until now, he has been with me. There have been plenty of moments that I know I gave him reasons not to be happy with me, and yet he has remained with me, beautiful, faithful God that he is. My story is my story. It's not yours. There are as many different stories as there are people here this morning. But what's your story? What was the moment that you first realized that God is with you? Did it happen at a church service one day? Did it happen at a table when a friend prayed with you? Did it happen at a quiet moment alone? And do you feel him with you now? When Jesus is inside of you, Paul says there are several things that you experience inwardly. When Jesus is inside of you, Paul says that God's power is inside of you. He writes here, he is powerful among you. By God's power, we live in him to serve. You know, when Jesus is with you, there's a holy confidence. There's a holy optimism. There's a holy courage. There's a holy boldness inside of you. I was talking to my son the other day, and he said, Dad, he said, I don't know why. He said, but whatever's happening, I always have a feeling inside of me that it's going to be all right. And I said to him, Ben, that's faith. That's the confidence that comes from Jesus inside of you. When Jesus is with you, God's love is inside of you. Paul says that he is the God of love and peace with you. The Holy Spirit lavishly pours the love of God into your heart. The Holy Spirit makes a love connection between you and the Father. You know that you belong to the Father and that he belongs to you. And the Holy Spirit enables you to love others beyond your own human ability. When Jesus is with you, God's peace is inside of you. Do you know Jesus bequeathed his peace to us as our inheritance? He said, my peace I leave with you. Amen. You know that word peace is the Hebrew word shalom. It means wholeness. It means nothing is missing and nothing is broken. The shalom of Jesus is the wholeness of his own personhood in which he walked on the earth. The shalom of Jesus is his own security of personal identity. It is perfect masculinity for men and perfect femininity for women. The shalom of Jesus is his own mental and emotional stability. It's his own soundness of judgment and wisdom and decision making. It's his own health in personal relationship. It's his own ability to cope and to navigate in the world. When Jesus is with you, this shalom, this peace is inside of you. 
When Jesus is with you, God's joy is inside of you. You know, when Jesus is inside of you, there's sort of a never-ending party in your spirit. The freedom that you have in him makes you joyful. Being in love with him makes you joyful. His presence makes you joyful. You know, his presence is described as wine. Wine make you a little joyful. Hope in his good promises makes you joyful. His work in your life makes you joyful. The Bible says it is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Jesus is coming again. Is faith in you? Are you in the faith? Is he with you? Can your hard answer pass or fail on question number one? Pop quiz. Seven questions to test if you're ready for his coming. Question number two. Do you function in the fear of the Lord? Do you function in the fear of the Lord? You know, the subjective test is the first and most important test, but it is not the only test. If Jesus is with you, you will definitely feel him inside. But if Jesus is with you, it will also be evident on the outside. There will be certain measurable traits, observable characteristics that are true of you, like the fear of the Lord. Throughout this whole letter, Paul writes again and again that his whole Christian life is lived in the sight of God. You see, the false apostles played politics. They were dishonest. They were manipulative. They misrepresented themselves. They misrepresented Paul. They bragged and they slandered. They flattered and intimidated. They pursued earthly promotion with no fear of eternal punishment. Paul functioned out of a completely different paradigm. He wrote, we make it our goal to please him since we know what it is to fear the Lord. We seek his approval, his commendation. We take great pains to do what is right in his eyes as well as the eyes of men. We commend ourselves to every man's conscience in his sight. Once more in these closing words, Paul says, all this time, do you think we were defending ourselves to you, Corinthians? No, we speak in the sight of God as those in Christ do. In a moment of divine encounter, God gave Paul a glimpse of the glories of heaven. We talked about it last week. Paul saw the judgment seat of Christ. He saw people receiving what was due them for the deeds done in their bodies, whether good or bad. And so Paul lived his entire life in the burning conviction that ultimately we are all accountable to God. Ultimately, we will answer to a higher authority than human government. Can I tell you, there's a higher court than the Supreme Court. It's the court of heaven. Ultimately, we will answer to a higher authority than society's morals and mores. Hebrews says we are all destined to die once and after that to face the judgment. Can you say like Paul that you live in the sight of God? Can you say that you live ever mindful of the resurrection of the dead and of the judgment seat of Christ? Jesus said, don't fear those who can destroy the body, that is, men. Rather, fear the one who is able to destroy both the body and the soul in hell. That's God. Beloved, whether Jesus comes again in our lifetime or whether we die and we go to be with him, one day soon we will all stand before him. In that moment, it won't matter what was legal on earth or what was acceptable in a fallen society. It will only matter what was acceptable in his sight. It won't matter what we were able to persuade men to believe about us. It will only matter what God knows to be true about us. Are you ready for his coming? Is faith in you? Are you in the faith? Do you fear the Lord rather than men? Can your heart answer pass or does it answer fail on question number two? Pop quiz, seven questions to test if we're ready for his coming. Question number three. You doing all right this morning? 
Are you meek like Jesus? The Corinthian church was plagued with all kinds of internal problems. Paul writes in chapter 12, I'm afraid when I come, I'm going to find quarreling and jealousy and outbursts of anger and factions and slander and gossip and arrogance and disorder. Problems like that in a church come from proud people. They come from self-promoting people. They come from people who desire to control, to push their own agendas, to be recognized. James wrote, what causes fights and quarrels among you in the church? Don't they come from your selfish desires within you? You kill and you covet, but you're never satisfied. In contrast to that is the meekness of Jesus. Though he did not have to grasp at equality with God because he is God, Jesus humbled himself and he became a servant. Beloved, can I tell you that meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength submitted to God. In these closing words, Paul talks about the weakness of Jesus. But you see, Jesus was not weak in his being Jesus was weak in the sense that he was totally submitted to the will of his Father. If we were in seminary, we'd say it like this. Jesus was not weak ontologically. He was weak voluntarily. That means that Jesus did not come to earth as God with one arm tied behind his back. Everything that Jesus did on earth, he did as God. Can I tell you that makes the cross all the more wondrous. Because on the cross, Jesus was not a man who was a shadow of a deity. On the cross, Jesus was God who had become a man. Amen. What about you? Are you meek like Jesus? The strengths God has given you, the resources, the gifts, the abilities, are they submitted to the Father? Or do you use them for self-promotion? Do you use your resources and your talents to try to take control, to try to attract attention to yourself or to push your own agenda? Do you draw people away from the mission of the corporate body to support you in your own personal ministry? Are you the source of quarrels, of factions, of slander, of gossip? Are you the source of confusion and disunity? If so, you're not ready for his coming. Meekness is strength submitted to the Father. It's one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, the evidence that Jesus is alive inside of us. Are you ready for his coming? Is faith in you? Are you in the faith? How does your heart answer? Question number three, pass or fail? Pop quiz, seven questions to test if you're ready for his coming. Question number four, we're over halfway there. Question number four, are you in solidarity with fellow believers? Are you in solidarity with fellow believers? Rather than the disunity caused by self-promotion, in these closing words, Paul pleads with us to pursue unity. He says, finally, brothers, encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And the saints send their greetings. Paul promoted two things among the church that were absolutely radical in the culture of Corinth and in the Roman world. The first thing was Paul's use of the term brothers. You see, in Greek and in Roman culture, it was unheard of to call any one brother except for someone who was your actual biological brother. In fact, it was illegal under Roman law to address a non-relative as brother. Second, it was unheard of for people of different genders and ethnicities and social classes to greet one another with a kiss. Kisses were reserved exclusively for family. It was unheard of for a slave to greet a prominent person with a kiss or for a Jew to greet a Gentile with a kiss. 
but among the church, kisses were exchanged during communion as a sign of oneness and forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, these were holy kisses, not creepy kisses, all right? These were not kisses on the lips. These were kisses on the cheek, or maybe we call them air kisses today. But through these two radical gestures, Paul reminds us that the church is unlike any other group and unlike any other organization in the world. Beloved, can I tell you that gathered here this morning, we are unlike any other club. We are unlike any other institution. We are unlike any other organization. We are unlike any other religious group. Muslims are not like the church. Buddhists and Hindus are not like the church. Spiritualists are not like the church. The church is the unique product of the finished work of the cross and the resurrection of Christ. The church is the unique work of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who initiates members into the church. It's the Holy Spirit that keeps members in the church connected to one another and to our head, Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit that keeps the church alive. That's why you will never kill the church because it doesn't depend on us. It depends on the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Paul poured out his life for the church. He said, I'll gladly spend everything I have, and I'll expend all my strength as well for the church. His heart was consumed for the well-being of the church. He said, I'm anxious for the church who is weak, and I do not feel weak, who is led into sin, and I do not burn with anger at the ones who led him astray. What about you? Do you have a sense of solidarity with other believers? Do you love his church? Are you active in a local expression of his church? Are you interested in his church? Are you fully invested in his church? Beloved, can I tell you, Jesus loves his church. He gave himself to save the church. And when he comes again, he's coming for his church. Are you ready for his coming? Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Being in the faith means more than just your personal faith in Christ. It means you are part of something bigger than yourself. It means you're part of the tradition that started with Jesus and was handed down by the apostles. It means that the same current of life that ran through them runs through you. It means that you hold fast to the same teaching. It means that you're part of a community of believers, whether it be a local church like ours or whether it be gathering in a living room to sing Kumbaya. If you're not part of a community of believers, you're not ready for his coming. Are you in solidarity with fellow believers? Does your heart say pass or fail? In just a few minutes, we're going to share communion together. Paul says during communion, we should examine ourselves. And specifically, what we examine is, are we in solidarity with the body of Christ? And so before we share communion this morning, I'm going to ask you to take one minute and go around and greet one another with not a creepy kiss, a holy kiss or a holy hug or a holy fist bump or a holy handshake, just as a sign of our unity with one another. Pop quiz, seven questions to test if you're ready for his coming. Do you sense his presence with you? Do you function in the fear of the Lord? Are you meek like Jesus? Are you in solidarity with fellow believers? Number five. Does your life display the fruits of repentance? Paul writes, I'm afraid that when I come again, I will be grieved over many who have sinned and have not repented. Every matter is established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. Now I'm repeating it in writing. When I come, I will not spare those who have not repented. The, the witnesses, the two or three witnesses were Paul's visits and Paul letters. He said, if you still haven't changed when I've come, these will testify against you. That's why I write these things while I'm absent so that I won't have to be harsh when I come. Can I tell you that one of the beautiful messages of 2 Corinthians is the incredible patience 
of the Lord with us. Paul wrestled back and forth with this church for over five years, and yet he never gave up on them. He kept pleading with them every way he could to repent of their sins. He, he tried fatherly encouragement. He tried tough love. He tried warnings. He even put off visiting them at one point to give them more time to change their heart before he came and had to administer judgment with the authority, unique authority Christ gave him. But in Paul's patience with the Corinthians, we see Jesus' incredible patience with us. With the world in such a mess, some people wonder, why is it that he waits so long to come again? But the Bible says it's out of his mercy that he waits, because he's yet giving us all time to repent. Peter wrote, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise to come again. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but wanting everyone to repent. Nevertheless, a day is coming when it will be too late to repent. When Jesus comes again or when he calls us home, there is no time to repent then. Peter goes on to say the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar and the elements will be destroyed by fire and everything done on earth will be laid bare. So he says, since you know this, what type of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives, making every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. When John was baptizing people in the wilderness, a group of Pharisees and Sadducees came down to the river to investigate what was this new religious ritual. John saw them and he said, you sons of snakes. There's some real seeker-friendly language for you. He said, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. What is the fruit of repentance? Quite simply, it's a changed life. To repent means to have a change of mind. It means to have a change of heart. It means to have a change of direction. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to men, but it ends with destruction. To repent means to rethink the way you're living your life. It means to think twice about the road that you're on and to choose something better. To repent means to experience sorrow in your heart for disobeying God, for damaging others and yourself. It means to change your course with God's help. You see, none of us can significantly change our behavior on our own. We need God's help to do that. And repentance is God's invitation to come and help us. What about you? Do you live your life? Does your life display the fruit of repentance? Are you different than you were before? Are you still changing for the better? Are you ready for his coming? Is faith in you? Are you in the faith what does your heart say about repentance? Does it say pass or does it say fail? Pop quiz, seven questions to test if you're ready for his coming. Number six, have you given up sexual impurity? Turns out that the Corinthians who lived 2,000 years ago have more in common with us than we knew. In both of our cultures, sex is an idol that is universally worshipped. In Corinth, sex was part of the idol worship that occurred in the pagan temples. Prostitution was an accepted way of life. It was not only tolerated in Corinth, it was venerated. You know, our temples might look a little different, but we worship sex as an idol just the same. Some of the Corinthians truly wanted to follow Christ, but they didn't want to give up their fun. Some gave it up for a while and then went back to it, and Paul says, this is no good. He uses three umbrella words here that cover the whole gamut of sexual sin that's defined in the Bible. He uses the word impurity. He uses the word runaway lust, and he uses the word porneia. We get our word pornography from porneia. It means fantasy sex. It means virtual sex. It means real sex outside of the covenant of marriage. Fornication and adultery, prostitution and homosexual sin. Paul wrote earlier that those who refuse to repent and give up such things 
will never enter the kingdom of heaven. But he also wrote about the amazing power of God to make someone clean from sexual impurity. He wrote, once you were sexually immoral, you were fornicators and adulterers, once you were dominant and submissive homosexuals, but now you have been washed. Now you have been sanctified. Now you have been justified. Later on, Paul said, I intend to present you as a pure virgin to Christ when he comes again. What kind of supernatural power is this? That God can take someone sexually impure and make him like a virgin again. Or make her like a virgin again. What kind of supernatural power is it that can totally wash away guilt and shame? That can take away haunting old memories? That can heal people who have been victims of sexual abuse? What kind of supernatural power is it that can restore someone body, soul, and spirit so that he or she is ready to find a Christian spouse and enjoy intimacy within the beautiful covenant of marriage just as if they had never messed up. Paul ends with that word justified. You have been washed, sanctified, and justified. Do you know what justified means? It means that God makes me just as if I'd never sinned. But in order to experience that kind of healing, you have to repent and you have to give up your sin. Are you ready for his coming? Is faith in you? Are you in the faith? Have you given up sexual impurity? If your heart cannot answer with a pass, we have resources here to help you. We have counselors to help you. We have groups to help you. We have pastors to pray for you. We have books to help you. But you have to swallow your pride and you have to take the help. Pop quiz. Seven questions to test if you're ready for his coming. The last question is this. You're almost done. Are you hungry for more intimacy with Jesus and to be made more into his image? Worship team, you can come help me. Are you hungry for more intimacy with Jesus and to be made more into his image? To the very end, faithful Paul prayed for the Corinthians who had been such a handful to him. In these closing words, Paul prays two things for the Corinthians and for us. He says, I pray you will not do anything wrong. And I pray that you will become complete in Christlikeness. He says, my prayer is for your perfection. That word, it also means for your complete restoration into the image of Christ. In verse 11, Paul says this. He says, aim for perfection. Aim for complete restoration into the image of Jesus. Beloved, can I tell you that that is the goal of the Christian life on earth. Perfection in Christ. Complete restoration. Complete wholeness. Complete righteousness. I pray that you won't do anything wrong ever. And I pray for your perfection. Beloved, can I tell you that better than most is not good enough for God. It's not the standard by which he'll measure you when he comes again. Better than I was, that's good, but it's not good enough yet. It's a good starting place, but it is not a resting place. God's desire for you is not better than most or just better than you were. God's desire for you is better and 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 better better until Jesus comes. God's desire is that you never stop growing spiritually, that you never stop desiring Him, that you never stop worshiping, that you never stop praying, that you never stop feeding on His Word, that you never stop maturing in your character, that you never stop bearing fruit and more fruit and much fruit. Can I ask you a question this morning? Is it possible that you're spiritually satisfied in a bad way? Is it possible that better than most is 
good enough for you? Or, or is it possible that better than I used to be has become good enough for you? Are you hungry for more intimacy with Jesus and to be made more into his image? Does your heart say pass or fail? Pop quiz. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Is Jesus Christ inside of you? Seven questions to test if you're ready for his coming. Would you stand and would you give Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place this morning?